Today, we want to speak on the political economy of the corona crisis. And um, I'll try to, to ask some relevant questions and to really get in a dialogue. You said you don't want just to give a lecture. No. Um, so I'm here and, and you, we will see how we get, um, uh, where we get. And first of all, Vandana, I would like to know where are you now? Uh, we heard um, that you have a severe lockdown in, in your very, country, in India. Very severe, very severe. I'm fortunately uh, in my ancestral home. I got locked down in my childhood home. So I'm in there alone. And uh, uh, with very fond memories of my parents, my child. And in I am talking to you from what used to be my mother's cow shed. And when I wanted to leave academics, because I was helping communities, uh, stopping mining, stopping logging, and um, my heart used to always say, if I could do this full time, we could do so much more rather than just in vacations. And my mother said, leave your job, take the cow shed. So the research foundation I started in 1980s was started in my mother's cow shed. And uh, that's the building where I'm sitting right now. And uh, because of that, the lockdown is not unbearable. <laughs> what I've heard, and you've also did an interview with the Right Livelihood Foundation, that it's a very severe situation for your country and for a lot of poor workers. And so, so first of all, could you give us uh, an idea of what is happening in your country right now? So to, to understand uh, this moment for India, it's very important to recognize that, you know, India got freedom with a particular idea that the earth, the land are for all, and we have very strong land reforms. We also had a Gandhian vision of building the economy, of small businesses, small farms, and all our laws protected small businesses and small farms. So when globalization, which is the structural adjustment program of, w of World Bank in 91 and the World Trade Organization in 95, in effect, basically, they started a war against farmers of India because 80%, 75% of India was farming. They were on the land. And then we had small businesses everywhere. We made most of our things. We made our clothes. We did everything. Um, and I'll give you a simple example of how things changed. The other day, I wanted a pin because my hair was standing out. And the only pins in the market are made in China. This is something we used to make, just in little corner shops. Um, so we lost a lot of farmers because of neoliberal globalization. Those farmers were then, either they committed suicide, which is the 400,000 figure, since 1995, or they were brought out from the villages by contract labor like they used to have in the, uh, you know, like the slaves used to be caught by agents. Agents would go to the village, pull people out, say, I'll get you a job in uh, a garment factory. I'll get you a job in a cement factory. I'll get you a job in this. And this was about half of India. Was, you know, so half of India on 8 p.m., 24th of March, was suddenly told in four hours it's locked down. So the, for the middle classes, it was all right, you know, they could get their groceries. Everything else was closed, but groceries and medicine was open. But the livelihood of half of India just evaporated. And, and this India works for its bread. Yeah. Every day you work, every day you earn something, every day you're able to get your bread. So not only did they lose their livelihood, they suddenly added to the ranks of the hungry. And globally, I think it's very important to realize that the global figures of what the ILO is saying, you know, they're saying the 3.3 billion working people, of which 1.9 are going to lose their work because of this lockdown. The proportion is much higher in India because if we have far more working people. 
in terms of hunger. The World Food Program has said that they'll, they already are billion hungry people. This is going to add a billion more. 130 million will be on the brink of starvation. And every day, if nothing changes over the next three months, 300,000 daily. Compare this to the corona deaths, please, sir. Huh? 300,000 daily are going to die for lack of food and hunger. So if I come to India, besides the fact that very large numbers have lost their livelihood, they haven't just lost their livelihood, they've been criminalized. We all could just stay at home, you know, I do a lot of work from Delhi, I built the Earth University, which is a partner in today's talk at the Nathania farm here in Dehradun. But yeah, I can't visit my farm either, you know. Um, I'm in my ancestral home. I'm not, I'm not able to move. But my lack of mobility is not starvation. But the lack of mobility of the poor worker, and we're talking about, you know, all the figures are about 120 to 140 million people. They weren't allowed to move. So many started to walk, and you'll see images of, of women with a big, all, all their possessions, all they have is a sack. It's on their head, and under their arm is a baby. And they're walking 400 miles, 500 miles, 700 miles, 800 miles. Can you imagine? And of course, many are dying on the way. And that's a number not being counted. There's so much counting of the corona deaths. Every day, every year in India, anyway, nearly a million children below five were dying of hunger. And there were 190 million hungry people already. But now you've added all those other millions. And we are talking of a very vulnerable situation. The other thing that the political economy of globalization did was I remember, you know, because I, being saving seeds and doing this work on agriculture. Uh, one of my big debates with the World Bank neoliberal policies used to be, they said, oh, stop growing food. No, 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 grow cash crops, and then you import your food. The farmers who work with us grew food and have food today. The farmers who went down the World Bank way, which is the neoliberal policy way, which is the reform way of all national governments, and they were told to follow the pot policy, and that's not the cannabis policy of America. The pot policy was grow potato and onion and tomato because McDonald's needs potatoes, Pepsi needs potato, uh, Pepsi needs tomato for, uh, for ketchup, for their pizza huts and all, everything. Those are the farmers totally stuck for not able to sell because all those long distance supply lines have absolutely collapsed. But you add another feature of the last 25 years. So India's had a very healthy diet. You might be poor, but you will have a chapati. And a chapati doesn't give you diabetes if it's all wheat chapati. Our wheats don't give gluten allergy. But the middle classes of India were pushed into admiring junk food, a McDonald's, a burger, a pizza, and all of those chips. So our children in the urban areas moved to a Coke and Pepsi diet. So we have very high rates of diabetes. We are the capital of diabetes in the world. We have seven, we didn't have diabetes as a big problem 30, 40 years ago. Some people had it, but just a few. Now it's 72 million and annually 1.1 million, 1 million are dying of diabetes. And then you take the corona infection the figures are so clear that just the infection doesn't kill you or kill maybe 0.5 percent point, at best 1 percent little variation in different countries. But if you have diabetes, the risks shoot up to 9.2 percent. And that's the case for India. It's the case for the United States. It's the case also related to the fact, and India is interesting, because in India, it's the middle classes who go to junk food. In America, it's the poor, it's the African-American who had to live on bad food. And they are the worst victims of the corona mortality. In India, the corona itself was brought by travelers from abroad. Every case 
can be linked. So it has also been called the disease of the rich, brought to India, where the poor are paying the price, and they are paying the price with their lives and their dignity. But what is happening now is only part of the story. A large part of the story is, is the kind of economy that is being built because, you know, everyone, or, or they are all talking about how uh, work from home will be the norm. Well, a person who works on a building site doesn't work from home. He works on the building site. Yeah. So the, the people who work physically can't earn their living sitting behind computers. So in effect, you're basically saying to half of India, you are disposable data. You are throwaway people. And I say political economy has shifted from an economic divide of some people having a private jet, 80-story bungalows, um, and someone having maybe a hut in the village, in the city, living on the pavement. But now this divide, and I don't think it's only for India, I think it's worldwide. This divide is, if we don't build a new solidarity movement, if we don't invigorate our democracies again, and realize that everyone has a right to live, what we could witness is the have and have not upper side could become a live and live not. So I'm, I'm just uh, wondering, Vandana, how could your government decide on such a measure? I mean, obviously you're not on their side, but could you just try to explain um, how such severe measurements could be taken? And as you tell it, and it's also as we are told here in Germany, the, the disastrous effects are so enormous. So, so how could someone, don't, um, don't those people count? Or is it just a kind of cognitive blindness? Or is it just a calculated measure? Well, I'll say two things. One, you know, neither the corona nor the lockdown idea emerged in India, you know. And if you, you know, my last book is called Oneness Versus the One Percent. It's not published in German, but it is available in um, other languages. It's available in Italian and in French. Um, it's available from uh, the New Internationalist in the UK. Uh, I wrote that because I saw a phenomena at the Paris climate uh, uh, summit. And the phenomena, phenomena was that the billionaires who had become billionaires through the process of globalization were actually standing on the stage with heads of state and telling the heads of state what they should do. So I wrote the book then, I said, something has changed in the political economy. We used to have elected leaders, heads of state, and they changed as elections came and went. Uh, and then because of our ability to influence our governments, we could not just change leaders, but we could change policy. But suddenly the huge amounts of money that globalization allowed a, a few technology barons who are called the new robber barons, uh, for them to accumulate so much wealth that they have more than a trillion. Jeff Bezos has more than a trillion and he made 24 billion in just the last month of lockdown. The same is the case with Bill Gates. So if you look, anyone who's following will find out that Bill Gates was talking about a coronavirus epidemic five years ago. He was talking about, in October of last year, he was already talking about a lockdown needed to manage this virus. Uh, so across the world, instructions have been given about how to manage it. So there are influences on policies that are beyond the reach of the people of the particular countries. Our government has a deep love for, you know, Gandhi uh, brought out the spinning wheel. He said, if we have to fight those satanic mills of England that have colonized the world, created slavery, taken over the land of the indigenous people, enslaved India, then I have to pull out a spinning wheel so that we can make our own cloth. And that spinning wheel was my inspiration when I saw Monsanto wanting to patent seed. I said, how do we stop this empire over life? And I took inspiration from Gandhi's spinning wheel. I said, well, 
we can save our own seeds. And for me, the seed became the spinning wheel. But our contemporary leaders have this deep admiration for technology. Now, technology has been around forever. Technologies are two tools. We choose them. And if we find their risks higher than the benefits for the public, we have created instruments to regulate technology. I had a big role in the Convention on Biological Diversity and in writing the framework for the biosafety protocol, which regulates GMOs. The reason Monsanto doesn't control every seed and bio doesn't control every seed in the world is because we have a law which we managed to put in place and we save seeds. So we save seeds on the one side, but put in law, place laws on the other side. But what I've witnessed in the last 10 years is a new discussion of technology as the new religion. Oh, but it's technology. And I say, of course it's technology. Let's assess it. Let's regulate it. Let's decide, do we want it? Let's decide, can you impose digital transactions on the poor who don't have a digital connection? Can you force education on computers on children who can't afford to buy it? a tablet. And this has happened in India right now. So what's happened is, you know, technology became the new religion of the trillionaires, the technology barons. And then you have governments who've fallen into that religious trap and they have no idea. It is cognitive blindness. Of course, it's cognitive blindness. But I also feel that along with technology having been made the new religion, the the money making has been made a new religion. Again, money has been around. Doing business was always there. People were grateful to people who generated wealth. East India Company was the first corporation created. We got rid of it. Then we had national businesses accountable to countries and citizens. Globalization took that accountability away. So we had global corporations and national governments. And citizens could only influence national governments, but corporations could influence governments everywhere. What has happened this morning, you know, my journey on organic farming started in 1984 when I uh, witnessed the state of Punjab where I had done my MSc honors in physics erupt in violence. It was the place where the, the Green Revolution experiment was first carried out. But it was also the year of Bhopal, where a disaster took place, a gas leak that killed 7,000 in that night and 30,000 after that. This morning, we've had another gas leak. We've had a gas leak in the city of Vizag, where a polymer company makes pellets for plastic toys when we had the most beautiful wooden toys and cloth toys and all of that craft industry has been crushed. So I've just literally, before I join you for this, I've prepared with the environmental community of this country, a statement to the government. So you keep destroying our forests, saying we have to have ease of doing business. You keep diluting safety norms and pollution laws to say ease of doing business. You're already announcing because there's a war in the world between China and the United States over the corona. And this, you know, for, for the students listening, this is the biggest part of the political economy of the corona, you know, the geopolitical warfare between the two giants. Suddenly, our industrialists and our government is saying, invite every company that wants to come from China to India and give them land and remove all the regulations, whether it's labor rights or it's environmental rights. So there's been a scandal yesterday because workers who wanted to go home to their villages were prevented from going home from the city of Bangalore, where I was for three years, 79 to 82, till I, till I came back to this cow shed. Um, and, um, and the justification of the government was, no, we've got to keep these workers here because when things will start, Construction industry must have its captive labor. And people are saying this is like colonialism when the British used to capture people, take them to Africa, take them to South Africa, you know, 
They used to capture Afri uh, Africans and take them as slaves to America. This is a new slavery. So you have a class of the poor turned into new bonded slaves and the other told, go. And my work, I've just been talking to the farmers we work with. I think our work is to revive the economy of the rural areas and give work to every hand, not through money, which has run out. I said, don't chase the money that abandoned you. Work with the earth. So when you say, where does it come from? It comes from worship of money making, worship of the tools of the money makers, and an inferiority complex about what you can do and a lack of compassion. Today, another, so we've had a gas leak this morning, but today is Buddha's day, Buddha Purnima. It's the day of compassion. And uh, of course, our prime minister is giving wonderful messages on Buddha and his compassion. But the test of that message is how do you deal with the workers? How do you deal with the victims of a gas tragedy? How do you deal with the farmers? How do you stop increasing violence against women and children? With the you know, the, the data on lockdown is so clear. As people are stuck, the violence against women has exploded 30% most countries. So all this, you know, any policy needs to take every aspect of society and every aspect of economy into account. And then say, okay, this is the balance we will create. You don't say, I'll pick one agenda that the billionaire gave me and implement it at any cost, no matter what the people have to pay. This for me is where the threat to democracy is very severe. And I do hope that Germany will be able to create more spaces to imagine a different future. I do it at my level, largely with grassroots communities and movements like the environmental movement of which I'm a part. Do you have any idea how those people in the streets, as you said, trying to walk to, to their um, hometowns? And I think there's so much creativity and so much dignity to people trying to fight for their lives and for the lives of their loved ones. Do you have any idea how these people, or could you give us an impression, how, how, how do people survive? I mean, well, it's just such a wonderful yeah. Yeah. act. So, you know, literally they've been pushed to the bottom. But when it comes to humanity, you have to look at their faces and their dignity. And, their, and I say, okay, let's, you know, people go to gyms and people do yoga. Carry a sack on your head for 400 miles. What is the resilience of that amazing body and the dignity and the pride? And for uh, those of you, you know, there's only one journalist who's covering this. Most of the others are sitting in their um, studios and repeating the same parrot repeat, but there's one young woman called Barkhadat, and she does um, uh, um, on, on a handle called Mojo. She has been on the roads interviewing the people walking home for 50 days. So look for Mojo and you will be able to witness directly much better than in the words that I can communicate. But one thing that's coming, from every one of them. One, I want to go home. Uh, they, for them, home is where their families are, where their land is. They left like so many people leave because money brought them here. But I think everyone has the right to home and I think we should be listening much more deeply about how belonging and being home is everyone's uh, identity and everyone's right. And the second they're saying is, we will die of hunger, not Corona. You know, Corona is not going to kill people in the world. Hunger will. And interestingly, exactly the same sentence has been used by young people in Lebanon today who have said, you are pushing us to hunger. These are, you know, young students of universities who are rebelling and say, you want to push us to hunger in the name of saving us from Corona? No, we are going to shape our future. So Mojo is the only place where you can see how, no matter when, you know, no matter which highway she went to, 
no matter which hive. And there's one particular episode where the husband walking home died before he reached. So she goes and talks to the wife and the daughter. And think, but still there's dignity. And I think humanity needs to learn what being human is from the people who are being treated as throwaway people and the people who think they can be the dictators to decide one third goes forever, one third can be turned into slave in exploitative bonded labor in factories and one third can be my slaves on a digital dictatorship. Those people should learn humanity from the dispossessed. You try to, to, to give a, um, a living community and a living atmosphere for people by, by being farmers who are not selling their crops to, one son, uh, to, to whomever. And could you give us an impression of what, what you are doing um, or what the farmers are doing so we get a real impression of how uh, resilient Uh, people can become in your country and grow. I mean, always, we're always dependent on nature. We're always dependent on politics and so on. But so, so we get a real idea of, of the, the independence and a new kind of dignity being yeah. able to grow. So as I mentioned, my, my work in agriculture began in 84. And I took a pledge, I will look for and promote nonviolent farming. I didn't know anything about agriculture as a discipline. My mother was a farmer, but um, you know, those days I was preoccupied with physics. In 87, the, you know, the corporations said, we now will uh, pattern the seed and uh, we will genetically modify seed to own the seed. That's when I started seed saving. So one of the things that our communities have is they have their own seed. Over these years, we have built through Nathania 150 community seed banks in different parts of the country. And wherever a farmer has a seed, they're not in debt because it's, it's the seeds bred for chemicals or genetically engineered seed that need chemicals that get farmers into debt for seed and for chemicals. That's the primary reason. About 70% of the debt is just for these inputs that are totally unnecessary because ecological agriculture is a much better way of farming. So our communities are seed savers and they're organic farmers. But over the last two years, as I was witnessing how there's a new concentration growing and a new convergence between the information technologies and the digital technologies, between the biotechnologies, between the financial technologies, because now they call FinTech They don't talk about, you know, it was money, then they made it capital, then they made it finance, and now it's called fintech, you know, which is this second transactions on risk-taking, on risks. And after the 2008 collapse of Wall Street, the two big asset management funds, they're called exchange-traded funds, And I write about them in my book because I was wanting to know how did Bayer take over Monsanto? What was the economics of it? Yeah. How much does Bayer have? How much does Monsanto have? And I found both have very, very large shares in the hands of the Black Rocks and the Vanguards. So Black Rock last year was $6 trillion dollars in this short period of the corona, short period of the corona, when a lot of bailouts were happening. You know what the assets of BlackRock are? $23 trillion. Large India with 1.3 billion people. We are a three trillion economy. Here's one BlackRock with $23 trillion. So where do they put their money? They put their money where they can make money. So they put their money in chopping the Amazon to grow GM soya to export to Germany because that's where the money is. It's not in leaving the forest standing. They put their money in uh, changing agriculture for the two future trends they want to see. One is digitalization of agriculture. <laughs> you know, Bayer just wrote yesterday that our sensors in the sky of digital agriculture will tell the plant when to tell the farmer that it needs water. 
I said, no, the plant knows when it needs water. And the farmer knows their plant that it needs water. But this, I said, first you said without chemicals, you can't grow food. Then you said without GMOs, you can't grow food. And now you're saying without our data and our digital monitoring, you can't grow food. So digital agriculture and financialization of nature. Those are two big issues. So when I started, you know, when I was doing my book, I was watching all this happen, changes in different parts of country, new projects being institutionalized. I started to work with my communities. I said, you've got to work on economic sovereignty. You know, yes, we've done seeds. Yes, we've saved organic. But don't look for someone far away to buy your organic produce. Treat the growing of food as taking care of the earth. And in the process, you'll be able to take care of your family's needs. And in the process, you will have food to share in the community. I just had a call from our communities in Bengal. And they, you know, in India, they always make you a relative and they call me older sister, Didi. So, Didi, you made us do our gardens and you told us about food sovereignty. And we have been able to have our own vegetables in spite of the lockdown and nothing could reach. We have also done calculations of what does it mean when you have a circular economy? Yeah? The farmer grows, eats, it circulates locally. About you know, 100% of the wealth creation stays in the village. So you remove poverty. Yeah? And if the farmer is growing one commodity that has to be sent far away, potato, in Bengal there were 30, 20 suicides of potato farmers, not now, two years ago, Pepsi buys potatoes from potato farmers. A sack of 20 kilograms is bought for five rupees, five rupees. And 75 rupees make a euro. So just think, yeah, one eightieth of a euro for 20 kilograms of a sack. 20 grams of potato chips is sold for 20 rupees. That's immediately 20,000% super profits going to the processing industry. So what our communities are doing is, you know, my work is really to basically not let the propaganda trap honest, hardworking farmers and to have them bring their knowledge back, their dignity back, their festivals back. And in the process, the women are bringing back native foods they're having food festivals and seed festivals. And, um, and I go sometimes to the communities and it is some of the most inspiring moments of my life to see how much is possible when people can shape the future and shape the economies. So my, you know, if it was seed and food sovereignty for the last 30 years, it has now got added with an element of Seed sovereignty, food sovereignty, knowledge sovereignty, because we'll have to become sovereign in knowing and economic sovereignty through living economies. And this is relevant everywhere in the world. Do your people still have ownership of land? I mean, that seems to be most important, isn't it? So do yeah. they, they still own their, their own yeah. land? So, you know... A, before the British came, people didn't own their land, but people had rights to their land. And so many of my books I've talked about the difference between use rights, use of victory rights, and uh, property rights and tradable rights. Because property is about a tradable commodity. So our law said the area you work is yours to work, but the work was about caring for the land. The British came and turned land into a commodity, grabbed it from the peasants, and made the peasant pay them rents. It was called lagan. 50% of the produce of the farmer had to be paid to the East India Company first, and then to the British. They created landlords to correct the rents. That wasn't part of Indian society. Yeah? And... This landlordism created the large land holdings. So the three things that happened when we became independent was we had very strict land reform. Yeah? And land went back to the farmers who were tilling the land. 
So our average land holding is two acres. So ever since globalization, not only have I been fighting for defending the rights of the farmer to their seed and, and actually ensuring our laws uh, protect the farmer's rights to seed, I've also been fighting against trick on trick on trick to do, take the land away from people. And the argument they always use is we need larger land holdings in order to produce more food. And that is not at all true because all the research is showing that the smaller the farm, you know, this is UN FAO research, that the smaller the farm, the more it produces, yeah? The data globally is 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms. So every time they come with this argument, you need large farms, we come back with our data to show the small farms are more productive. And we prevent the creation of basically a land grab. But I know through digital agriculture, they're going to try it again. And I'm working with our communities to be ready to say, no, land sovereignty is not just our birthright. But now with half of India coming back to villages, we need land for livelihoods. You can't have us thrown out of the city and thrown out of our land. You know? So this is really the moment. But people have been made landless because of debt. And a lot of the suicides were because the day they said, your land is my land now because you're in debt. That's the day the farmer drank pesticide to end his life. So landlessness is coming through the market and through debt. But land rights of the smallholders is the pattern of India. What would you like to see as a reaction or outcome of the corona crisis? That how, how, how should we unite? How should we stand together in a kind of political resistance? So I think one thing is that across the world, it would be good for people under lockdown to say, oh, I could live with so much less. Yeah. And that, you know, Wolfgang Sachs had created this language of enoughness and self-sufficiency. So I think, you know, the, the, the global greed economy, the extractive economy, requires you to constantly consume. And I've watched this happen with the, with the you know, clothing industry. You know, I still wear my mother's saris, you know. They last a century. <laughs> And uh, my own saris are 50 years. Um, but first they created the fashion industry. Then they destroyed local textiles, local garment industry. Then they took the manufacturing to slave factories. They made Indian farmers grow the BT cotton under slave conditions where they were committing suicide. And, uh, and it's not enough for them. So then, you know, the latest really is the fast fashion industry wants you to get used to the fact that you buy clothes only to wear once. That's what they want young people to think, that clothes are throwaway clothes. Yeah. So I think the first is we have to get off the consumer treadmill and take conscious decisions about what is it that I really need? What is the footprint of what I consume? And what is it that brings me satisfaction? That's basic principle on every aspect of life. But there's so many young people who come to us at the Earth University wanting to learn just two things. One, how do you farm? without external inputs? And two, how do you create a good life on your terms while protecting the earth? That's why they come to the Earth University. And I hope when the lockdown is open, some of your students will be able to come and, and be there. But in, you know, I have, uh, like I said, as a physicist, I didn't really need to think about too much. But when I started to move to agriculture, I took a lot of inspiration from Gandhi, whether it's saving seeds, following the spinning wheel, um, or it's self-rule and self-governance. But this idea of self-governance has for me been hugely reinforced by my studies in ecology, that a seed grows into a tree because it is self-organized from within. Yeah? The pattern of its evolution is built into it. So in quantum theory, we have the word 
of enfoldment, you know, the, could put, the potential of the quanta to become something else is enfolded in that quanta, yeah? Similarly, in a seed is enfolded the potential of the kind of plant that seed will become. It doesn't need Monsanto to say, seed, grow. Seed, don't become a coconut, become an acorn, you know? No, plants don't have to be instructed at every minute. They're self-organized. So Gandhi's idea of Swaraj and self-rule and self-organization as a political term is reflected in the scientific world with a new word called autopoiesis, the self-organization. We got independence because we said we've been destroyed by our land being taken, by our making of our clothes being taken. So Gandhi said, we'll make our own clothes. I think every young person, no matter where they are, it could be in Germany, it could be in France, it doesn't matter where you are, start growing your food. It could be in the city, on a balcony. You know, when the collapse happened, the Greeks were stuck. They'd lost their jobs, there's nothing. And this young man came to me and said, what do I do? I live in Athens. I said, grow food on your balcony. A year later, he meets me and says, I feed my entire street. One balcony. Yeah, because we've been constantly made to think of nature as inert and dead matter to be exploited, we forget how much we can produce in co-creation. The third is we have to learn to build local economies. Um, so far with globalization, everyone in the North and the South has responded to the machine that told them, get this job, moved to this city. So everyone moved away from their home to some other place. And now everyone's having to move back. Now that everyone's having to move back, it's time to think, oh, what is the kind of economy? And I'm doing a dictionary, see yeah, I'm doing a dictionary of uh, economic terms because I'm finding every word changed its meaning after the East India Company. The word invest used to mean to care to make beautiful. After the East India Company was created by 1610, the word invest became to make profits. So today we say invest in, we mean money to make profits. Investor rights, yeah, the vocabulary has changed. We need to reclaim our economic imagination and our economic thinking because the destructive economy being naturalized is a very short lifetime, yeah? The globalization is only 25 years. And we shouldn't allow this corona period to become an experiment of the next destructive phase of an economy which doesn't care about the earth, which doesn't care about people, which doesn't care about the future of the young. It just cares for how much, how much can the trillionaires multiply their trillions. So let's uh, let's talk a bit about your Earth University, uh, which you know I'm very curious of. Um, do you do any changes to curricula, and how can you teach? How can you keep up educating and edu uh, education as such? Or, um, did you have to close? Uh, can you just keep the dialogue with the students and the staff? So how is it working at present? Well, you know. For the seed saving, I thought about it. For the organic farming, I thought about it. But the distribution, it, the farmers thought about it. And for the Earth University, people just started to descend on our farm. And then I had to put up buildings, you know, and create the dorms and create the rooms and create the courses. So they were in, in response to people's needs. So we didn't begin with a curriculum. We began with the fact that people were looking for a different kind of learning. So I call it a learning center where you learn from nature, you learn from peasants, you learn from each other, and you learn from yourself by reclaiming your full identity. Because my understanding right now of, of education has, is that learning, education knowledge moved from what, you know, what you call it, the existential knowledge you know, existential economies, into learn, into, in, you know, into um, pen and paper, you know, reading and writing. And then the more distant you were, 
they created an hierarchy of expertise that the more distance you were, the higher your expertise. So the less you knew, the more you knew. Yeah. And there's a beautiful poem of a, a woman from the Andes saying, Professor, look at the flowers across. Can you recognize what they are? You can't because you don't know potato flowers. And uh, each of those 200 varieties of potatoes are my blood and my flesh. I have grown them. So that knowledge where we are really one with nature, I think we are at a watershed in knowing in a double way. Because on the one hand, you know, this knowing by being, knowing by doing, was shifted to knowing through objectification of the object of knowledge. And this then reduced our brain from being a synthesizing brain to analytic brain. This was then put fast forward on the zero one, you know, programming, which is what the digital world is about. And I think what's happening with the rapid shift to a digital economy and digitalization of learning and, and the language of artificial intelligence is they're forgetting that intelligence is a multiple. Just like a plant has multiple functions, human beings have multiple intelligences. We have an intelligence to cooperate. We have an intelligence to have compassion, which is the kind of compassion that uh, in, in intelligence that seems to have died in those who can watch millions on the streets and not take care of them. Um, there's an emotional intelligence. I mean, even the psychological world is talking about emotional intelligence. And uh, we know the intelligence quotient was totally cooked up as a racist thing. Uh, so the multiple intelligence are a holistic intelligences. And they come from a unity of learning through head and heart and hands. Yeah? The analytic reduction of what I call mechanistic thought and downloading it into a computer program and then calling that artificial intelligence will never be able to reproduce the lived intelligence of living beings, living plants, living human beings. And for future generations to not be atrophied intellectually, you know, just like if you don't use your legs, your legs get atrophied. You don't use your hands, your hands get atrophied. We are the risk of atrophying our minds and our brains. So we do need to shift the idea of education to come back to learning how to care for each other, knowledge of care, capacity for care, which means knowledge more deeply of who you are, knowledge more deeply of where you are in nature, and knowledge more deeply of where you are in community. So it does mean, and you know, Gandhi had worked this out again. I mean, that man was amazing. You touch anything, he's worked on it. He had called it the new education, Naitali, head, heart, and hand education. He says, you can't teach children from textbooks. Let them take care of the cow. And in the process, let them also learn the alphabet. So it's not the case that people who came through that education were less, they became our leaders. You talked about it already, um, and I'm working on it as a philosopher. I'm working a lot of it uh, about it, so I'm quite curious about the role of imagination. I'm Im I mean, it's a it's a means of uh, imagining the the past in different ways, as you said, not just telling one story. And it's also the the possibility of imagining a new few kind of future. So, so what kind of role does imagination play in your idea of education? You know, for me, education is about just like for the quantum, the potential to become a wave or a particle. That possibility is there. But what it becomes depends on the environmental context, on the machine, you know, on, on, on the measurement system. That's why they say in quantum theory, the observer creates the observed. Uh, it's a bit crude, but it basically talks about potential as an unfolding. Uh, Imagination is really that potential to be creative. And, and this reading, writing, arithmetic thing was basically get people to learn by rote. But now what is happening is they keep saying, oh, but your learning is outdated. Yeah. And every few years, you are made obsolete in your own lifetime. Yeah. 
Imagination is that which allows you to have the highest expression of your own potential. What you could be, yeah? What the future could be. And it's imagination that, you know, I believe that there are powers in the world that would like human imagination to end, yeah? They're very crude, money-making, extractive systems to be the only imagination humanity has left. And imagination is the only thing that will rescue us and not make this lockdown, a permanent lockdown of our minds, our brains, our being, our future. Yeah, it's kind of, I think it's very interesting because it seems to me that it's really hidden in ourselves, like the imagination, and capitalism tries to drill a hole and to extract it. Um, yeah, but on the yeah, same time... Say, it, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, so when, the, when Australia was colonized and, it, you know, the Aboriginal people had farmed for 60,000 years and they turned them into Bushmen and said they don't have any right to land and took over the land and they defined it as terra nullius. It's an empty land because they're not white like us mm. and they don't grow apple trees. When Monsanto was trying to patent seed, I said, oh, now they've come up with bio nullius. A seed is empty unless it has their gene in it and they create the seed. And I think what we are going through now is an experiment in what I would call mentinalius, you know? The mind is empty. You extract, modify, and pour into the mind as if it's an empty container. I think that is the resistance movement of our times, that we are not empty containers. And you had asked, you know, what's the thing that could connect us? Let me just mention two things. One is 2nd October is the day of Gandhi's birth anniversary. It's also the day of Satyagraha, which is the third inspiring principle from Gandhi, the force of truth, to know the truth, to be able to make out, no, no, this is fake, this is real. Um, that is true knowledge. You see, knowledge, first you have wisdom, then you have knowing and discrimination. Yeah? And knowing itself is of multiple kinds. Yeah? Then you have facts, you know, and then you have, after facts, you have data. So you're taking the lowest level of a reductionist understanding of knowing and making the future build on data. So data is what's extracted when and all the data is processed and then sold back to you. And you're made to believe you don't have the imagination, you don't have the capacity, you don't have the creativity, you don't have the knowledge. That is the new colonization. And I would suggest that we, we celebrate on 2nd of October this year, across the world, according to what the communities find as their freedom and find the reasons for their unfreedom to say, this is the imagination we will make real. And this is what is not worthy of obeying. Basically, Satyagra, the force of truth, was the foundation of not obeying the racist laws of South Africa, which said Indians were not going to be treated as citizens, or the British laws that said salt will be a British monopoly, or what I did with the seed, when Monsanto wanted to have seed as a monopoly. I think it has now come, you know, we need a liberty of, the, of humanity and the human mind. And what enslaves us and what frees us, what frees us is imagination. What enslaves us is control of our minds. I think it would be brilliant exercise for the young people to go through this from now to 2nd October, and then we just have celebrations around the world. What would you be your advice uh, for pe young people being locked down in Germany and in other parts of the world? What would, you, what would your advice be of how to spend this time? which is really a time of slowdown and we're talking about people who are not starving. So, so yeah. what would, would you be at advice of how to, what to yeah. do for the next So, time? you know, I, I've been asked to write a book on slow living and it's basically, you know, they want me to, you know, exactly what you're saying. Uh, how do you slow down? But you can't slow down without knowing that it's worth slowing down and you can still have a meaningful life. And in fact, more time 
to enjoy life. Uh, Bill Gates has said, uh, time is our worst enemy. You've got to rush everything without testing. Yeah. No, and I say time is not our enemy. Because when you are slow, you walk with consciousness and mindfulness and imagination. So the first is everyone in the slow in this lockdown should think of what is it they really enjoy doing and do it. You know, I actually repaired so many of my clothes because I never used to before the lockdown, I had no time. I didn't have time to breathe. I'd go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And now I could pick up a needle and a thread and fix a little hole. You know, mending clothes can be very meaningful. So find out what you like to do and find a way to do it. If you want to do it with community, create the community around you. The second is the equally important. What is it that you find oppressive? What is it that you don't feel you need to do? And build the courage and the imagination to say, I can do without that whether it's your consumption or your participation in systems that are oppressive of you, of the earth, or other people. And unleash your imagination to imagine the future that you would like to see two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now for the next generation. I think the first is we have to get rid of the, what I call the colonial hierarchy of work, that the colonizer sat and uh, ruled with violence or from a desk, and the people who worked starved to death, 60 million starved to death. In so this devaluation of work is totally constructed. Women, you know, they say women don't work. Women carry the work on their backs with the work they do. You know, the day women stopped working, economy will collapse. Society will collapse. So the invisibility of work and the devaluation of work has to be corrected. And we should not have an hierarchy of work. We should have a horizontal choice of work. Someone likes to sit with paper and be a writer. That's fine. Someone likes to play a violin. That's also good. Someone likes to garden and farm. That too should be respected. Someone likes to weave, that should be respected. So we've got to you know, take this hierarchy that at every point got rid of large numbers, yeah? First they got rid of original people, indigenous people. Then they got rid of, of the fossil fuel economy. It, it has a very artificial definition of productivity. This is what my work in agriculture has been. Then it's not how much you produce from a piece of land. Our work is based on measuring nutrition per acre. And with ecological farming, you produce more. What they measure is how much, <laughs> how, how more acreage is farmed by a farmer. So as the input, so which means <clears throat> productivity is artificially defined as the fewer the farmers. So the, fewer, the less the care, the more productive your agriculture, even though in actual food terms and nutrition terms, you're producing less. So we need to stop treating human beings as inputs in terms of labor, and then you devalue different kinds of labor. We need to put all the discussion Sylvia and I were having on, we need to put all creativities in a horizontal plane. And just like we've learned now 30 years later, we've learned the language of biodiversity. And I say what we need now is a cultivation of the biodiversity of the mind. And we need biodiversity of economies and we need biodiversity of work. I don't think it's right to have this inevitable, you know, I, I don't believe in inevitability. I've had to deal with so much colonization in my life. I say, you say this is inevitable, but it's your project and we will not be subjugated to it. There is no inevitability in human history. Humans, some humans want to impose on others, other humans rise in freedom. That's how history gets written. And I think it's extremely important to not accept as an inevitability that so much, so many of the current rubber barons are saying that with digital technologies, we only need, uh, we need only 1% of the people, 99% will be useless. And I think that's wrong. I think every human being has something different to give. Yeah. And 
for younger generations, I think, you know, I work with children in schools. They're the happiest when they're gardening and messing up in their, with the dirt. I don't think we should deprive that for the, you know, them of that freedom. Some kids like to paint and draw. They can be artists. Why are you deviving an artist and why are you overvaluing a speculator on finance? You know? So I think we need to revisit work and imagine. I think that's where imagination is needed. Imagination of the future of work. One little thing let me add is the coronavirus and the new 300 new epidemics that have come and affected humanity have come as a result of deforestation because of agribusiness. Mm -hmm. GM soil in the Amazon, palm oil in the rainforest, this invasion is because of an inefficient agribusiness system that then converts these ingredients into biofuel, into uh, uh, animal feed, 10% of soya goes for human food. Now they want to use soya to make fake food. You might have heard of an impossible burger. Yeah. Impossible burger basically is GMO soya modified with 32 processes in a factory, mm -hmm. in a factory. And they even make blood in the lab and say it's vegetarian, it's vegan burger. Mm -hmm. And they call it impossible. And two things about this impossible burger that I think is important is the and it's being financed by Silicon Valley, you know. Silicon Valley has now gone into industrialization of food because there's big profits to be made. Um, he says if there's an un, unimproved technology, then anything that improves it will make money. But real food is not an unimproved technology. Real food is real food. It's not a technology, it's nourishment, it's life. Second, Bayer has said that our mega-sized farms and our future of digital agriculture and farming without future is very suited to this kind of fabrication of food where we will grow not food, but carbohydrates and proteins as raw material for a new fake food industry. I call it the fake food industry because, you know, I grew up thinking food is unimportant. 35 years of my life, I've dedicated to understanding food. And now that I, I both taste real food and it's different, and I do the research on it, I think it's a crime against humanity to deprive anyone of the knowledge of good eating and to deprive anyone of having access. And because we can grow more food that is real by taking care of the earth on smaller farms, the 80% I said, I think we need to stop being afraid and we need to get rid of the fake cost that that's cheap. It's not cheap because you are paying with your health. You're paying with new epidemics. You're paying with lockdown. You're playing with diabetes. You're paying with cancer. That cost is very high. You're playing with climate change. Why should we as human beings bear the cost? So an industry that has got used to making money by faking food continues to fake it more and we fall more sick and the planet falls more sick. We've got to put a stop to it. First is before colonialism, which is just a 500 year old experiment, the world was based on colony. Yeah? Communities recognized that this is a commons. As I mentioned, there was nothing like a private property. You belong to the land, the land did not belong to you. Yeah? You could use it. And uh, water was a commons. I mean, all, my work throughout the period of, uh, of WTO has been. Uh, resisting privatization of the commons, whether it's Coca-Cola or Swayze in Delhi. And uh, we've had to, you know, we've, we've managed to uh, succeed against the biggest interests. Uh, so commoning in water, commoning in seed is my life's work through Navdanya. I, as I mentioned, when I talk knowledge sovereignty, I, will, I don't talk of sovereignty in terms of atomistic freedom, because I don't think there is an atomistic freedom. Because we are interconnected, we are in a web of life, we are in community, that every aspect of life, and I mean life, is a commons. And every aspect of living is a commony. Whether it's imagination, whether it's growing your food, protecting your water, act 
actions done at the law, small level multiplied many fold to deal with the climate crisis. The thing I learned both from my ecological research as well as Gandhi's teaching is the oppressive powers from top down are big. We imagine that only equivalent business can deal with them, but many smalls working through commoning are bigger. And that's why it is a universal principle and it's scaling up, as I said, for the work answer, it's scaling up is not vertical, it's scaling up is horizontal. And I'm talking increasingly about organizing as communities through commoning, creating living economies through commoning, and circle on circle on circle of living economies will be the future. And if we manage to do that, we have a future. And if we don't manage to do that 100 years from now, all of the human species will be extinct. And given the brutality and injustice of this lockdown, 20, 30% of humanity will be pushed to starvation within the foreseeable future. So we are really seeing a closure of the future on the current path of privatization and closures and an opening of the future through commoning.